Let's talk about natural frequency for equivalent system. If we have our simplest system, which is a spring mass system like that, we know that when we get the governing equation, that is a second order differential equation, mass times acceleration plus the constant of the spring times the displacement is equal to zero. We define the natural frequency as the square root of the coefficient that goes with the displacement divided by the coefficient that goes with the acceleration, which is the mass. For any other system, we will find the governing equation. If we are able to write in the following form, very similar to this one, we will define the natural frequency as the coefficient that goes with the displacement divided by the coefficient that goes with the acceleration. We like to work with a free vibration and undamped torsional system. We have a coordinate system that x, y is in the plane of the disk and c is along the axis of the shaft. If we do our free body diagram, when we have a clockwise displacement, we will have a moment done by the torsion of the shaft in the opposite direction. We do the equation of motion by adding external moment and the inertia moment, which is the mass moment of inertia respect to point O times the acceleration. The natural frequency will be the coefficient of the rotational displacement over the coefficient that goes with the acceleration. From the theory of torsion, we know this relationship where mt is the torque that produces a twist of angle theta, g is the shear modulus, l is the length of the shaft, i sub zero is the polar moment of inertia of the cross-sectional section of the shaft, and d is the diameter of the shaft. The polar moment of inertia is given by this equation. This is mechanical so material. The torsional spring with the torsional constant will be equal to the moment divided by the rotational displacement. Then we got that is g times i sub zero divided by the length. We substitute i zero. We are able also to define the j, which is the mass moment of inertia of the disk respect to the center. And remember that rho is the mass density and h is the thickness of the disk, d is the diameter, and w is the weight. And this is how we can write the natural frequency in terms of the variables of the system, which describe the material of the system and the weight and the shape of our disk and our shaft with this expression right here. The next system that we will analyze is the free vibration of a simple pendulum. A simple pendulum is composed by a massless bar and a mass at the end, and it's fixed at the other end right here at the top. Let's do the equations of motion using Newton's law. And here we have the three body diagram and the kinetic diagram. In blue, we have the forces, which are the tension and the weight. And in orange, we have the kinetic forces, which is the tangential acceleration times the mass and the mass times the normal acceleration. Let's add forces in the tangential and we have that negative weight times sine of theta will be equals to mass times length of the bar times theta to dots, which is the angular acceleration. And then that if we put everything in one side of the equation, following the principle of the Lambert, we get the equation of motion. As you notice, this equation has a sine of theta instead of as only a theta. Therefore, it's a nonlinear equation. We can do this same analysis using the conservation of energy. We have the potential energy, the weight. We gain potential energy by when we go up. And we have the kinetic energy of the system is one half of mass times the velocity of the mass squared. We will derive this expression respect to time. When we derive respect to time, remember we have to derive respect to theta and theta respect to time. We derive the 
expression for the potential energy, which is mass, gravity, length times one, which is zero, the derivative, and the derivative of cosine is negative sine. The derivative of the theta respect to time is theta dot. We derive the kinetic energy respect to time. We have two times m l square theta, and the derivative of theta respect to time is theta two dots. We put this together, and as you recall, as we have done in different other problems, we take out the theta dot, which is common for both terms, and what is in the brackets become our equation of motion. As you see, we have the same equation are nonlinear. Therefore, we have to linearize this equation. So for very small angular displacement, we could say that sine of theta becomes similar to theta. And if we substitute sine of theta by theta, we have a linearized equation of motion. And what is the natural frequency of this equation? The, it will be the square root of the coefficient that goes with the rotational displacement over the coefficient that goes with the acceleration. Square root of g over l. That's the natural frequency of a pendulum. As you see, it is independent of the mass. Let's now analyze the free vibration of a compound pendulum. When we have a rigid body that is pivoted in a point other than the center of mass, this body will oscillate out about the pivot under its own gravitational force. Let's get the equation of motion using Newton's law for two reactions at all because we have a pivot and then we have the weight which is the only force. We take moment about O and then we have the moment produced by the components perpendicular to the distance from O to the center of mass that will be equals to the mass moment of inertia of the body respect to O times the angular acceleration. We put that in one side of the equation and we get the equation of motion. As you see, this is a nonlinear equation. We can linearize the equation by assuming small displacements. Then the sine becomes theta. We substitute sine of theta by theta and then we have a linearized equation of motion of a compound pendulum, which will be the natural frequency of our pendulum will be the square root of the component that goes with the rotational displacement divided by the component that goes with the angular acceleration. This is our natural frequency of the system in terms of the radius of gyration. Remember the definition of radius of gyration for mass moment of inertia is equal to the square root of mass moment of inertia divided by the mass. Therefore, we can substitute these two terms by the radius of gyration square. In terms of the uh, radius of gyration, we could find a equivalent length of the compound pendulus respect to the simple pendulus we analyzed in the previous slide. Let's calculate the effect of a mass of a spring in the static behavior and in the dy dynamic behavior of a system. First, let's do the static analysis. We will assume that every spiral of a spring is a tiny spring and then that we have n number of springs in series. Every single spiral will have a mass of the total mass of the spring divided by the number of spirals of the spring. The constant of each of the spirals will be equals to n times the total constant of the whole spring. The deflection of the first spiral will be due to the weight of the rest of the spirals. So we have to only take into consideration the mass of the spirals that are underneath that spiral. And as you recall, the static deflection is the mass over the constant of the spring from this equation right here. 
we go with the second spiral is the same now the first spiral that is above doesn't create any deflection so only the spirals that are below that spiral create deflection in that little piece of spring if we move forward down the deflection of the eye spiral due to the weight of the rest of the spring below can be the, defined by this equation right here the last spiral will not have any weight underneath therefore will have no deflection so in general we can have that the total deflection will be the adding all this tiny deflection of each of the spirals and then we get this expression right here in an arithmetic sequence we can substitute this term by this term we can cancel out this n with this n square and then for the limit of considering that every single piece of elastic material is a spiral we can consider infinite number of spirals and these terms become one for the limit of infinite spirals the deflection is one half of the mass therefore will be equivalent to place a concentrated mass of one half of the mass in the end of the spring so here we have our equivalent system if we have a spring with a mass it will be equivalent to consider a spring without a mass and a mass of one half at the end of the spring let's continue with the effects of this mass of a spring to do a dynamics analysis so let's consider a differential of mass in at dy here at the spring that differential of mass will be a linear relationship where we have the total mass of the spring divided by the total length of the spring. We will assume also a linear velocity of the spring, right, of every spiral of the spring. So the velocity of this differential will be this length divided by the total length and multiplied by the velocity at the end of the spring. If we do our kinetic energy, we have the kinetic energy of the mass at the end and the kinetic energy of these little pieces of spring and we have to integrate from zero to l and if we do that integral and we evaluate from zero to l with this the limit of integration which is the length of the spring so as you see this is our total kinetic energy we can conclude that it will be equivalent to place a concentrated mass or one third of the mass at the end of the spring so we will have a system like that we have a spring with mass at a mass at the end and we can write a equivalent system with a spring without a mass and a mass that we had before plus one third mass of the spring let's do some examples of calculation of the natural frequency for different systems for example we have a mass and two springs k1 and k2 are those spring in series or are those spring in parallel as you see when i apply a displacement to mass a remember that we measure the displacement respect to the equilibrium position therefore we will not take into consideration the weight as an external force because the weight will cancel out with the static deflection of the springs so when we apply a displacement we got a force for the spring one and the force for the spring two when we applied our equation of motion we'll see that these two forces are and are equals to the mass times the acceleration and as you see those springs behave as they were in parallel because they have the same displacement the equivalent constant of the spring will be adding both springs and therefore the natural frequency will be the equivalent constant of the springs divided by the coefficient that multiply the acceleration the square root of that the second example is that we have three springs those two springs will be in series and those two springs will be in parallel with this one here so here those two springs transmit the same force through this point and between this one and this with they transmit the same displacement of the mass so please review when we demonstrated how to calculate two 
sprints in series. We did it in the first week, the first presentation. And then, as you see, this force will be the equivalent for those two springs, and this force will be for spring three. If we apply our equations of motion, we get this expression right here. Therefore, this becomes the equivalent uh, springs uh, constant. And therefore, our natural frequency will be the square root of the equivalent springs constant divided by the constant that will go with the acceleration. The final example that we will see in this slide is a torsional system. We have two bars. These two bars are very similar to these two springs. Those two bars are in series. They transmit the same torque. And these two are in parallel because they transmit the same displacement through the a inertia disk that we have right here. So we have bar, three bars on known diameter or known radius and known length and of course known material with this shear uh, constant and we also have to know the area moment of inertia of this cross-sectional area and we know the properties of this disk so that we can calculate the mass moment of inertia. When we applied our equation of motion, so we take torque of this disk, we get our equation of motion. This here will be our equivalent constant of the spring, and this is here the mass moment of inertia. Our natural frequency of the system will be the square root of the equivalent constant of the spring divided by the coefficient that goes with the rotational acceleration. Let's calculate the natural frequency for a system of pulleys. We have two pulleys, pulley one here right there, and pulley two. And we have an unextensible cord that goes through the pulleys and is attached to a mass M. It's very important that we know that this a rope do not behave as a spring because it's unstensible. And then we have two springs, spring one attached to pulley one and springs two attached to pulley two. Let's do the analysis of motion of both pulleys. As you see, since this is un unextensible, this point G has zero velocity. And the point E will have two times the displacement of the point F, which is the center of the pulley. We do a similar analysis for pulley 2. We know that the displacement of D will be the same displacement of E. The cord, how much the cord displaced at E will be exactly the same as D. If we analyze the other end of the pulley, which is B and is the same as the mass, this will have double as much displacement as the point C, which is the center of the pulley. Now let's do our free body diagrams of each of the pulleys. The pulleys are massless, so we are considering that it's the only mass of the system is the block. So that's why we have only one degree of freedom. If the pulleys would have a mass, we will have three degrees of freedom. Uh, we do the free body diagram of pulley one, we have two tensions, and those two tensions are equal because we don't have friction in the pulley. This is an ideal pulley with have no mass and no friction. Then we have the force of the spring one, which will be equal to the constant of the spring times the displacement of this point F. We add forces in Y, and we see that 2T, or 2 tension, minus the force of the spring is equals to zero because we don't have any mass. Otherwise, it will be the mass times the acceleration of the center of the pulley. But we have no mass, therefore this is equals to zero. Therefore, the displacement of the point F can be related to the tension as 2T over the constant of the spring. We do the free body diagram of mass 2, and we have 2 tension equal the force of the spring 2. 
and that will be equals to the constant of the spring times the displacement of the point C. We add forces in Y, and similarly, as the free body diagram one, we have no mass, therefore we have negative two T plus the constant of spring two times the displacement of C, and then we have the displacement of C related to the tension. Now let's do the relation of the displacement of the mass M with respect to the center of the pulleys. F, the displacement of the center, so it will be the displacement of E, plus the displacement of B, which is 2C. So the total displacement will be 2, this displacement, plus 2, this displacement. That allowed us to find a relation with the total displacement of the mass with the tension of the core. If we solve for the tension of the core, then we do the free body diagram of our mass, and we have that this is the tension of the core minus the weight, and this is equals to mass times acceleration, and that leads us to our equation of equilibrium. As you know, this term right here is the weight. We did not measure the mass, the displacement with respect to the position of equilibrium. So that's why we have a constant right here. This represents only a displacement in the vertical axis in our solution. Finally, we find our natural frequency will be the square root of our equivalent constant of the spring divided by the equivalent mass. And this is the term of the equivalent constant of the spring divided by the equivalent mass. And this is our natural frequency of this pulley system.